God bless you. All right, good evening, everybody. Let it, let's uh, get right into it as we do. Review time. <clears throat> set the stage, set the table for where we are in our uh, Church History 101, whatever we want to call it, uh, historical theology, this study of church history that we continue to go through. And last couple weeks, we have gotten into the Reformation period. And we are talking about the 16th century. Most of us, when we think of the Reformation, we think of Martin Luther. We think of 95 Theses. We think of uh, probably October 31st, 1517, nailing the Theses on the uh, Castle Church door there, <coughs> excuse me, in Wittenberg. And so we discussed and unpacked that a lot. The Reformation, where was that happening? Where, where, where were we? Where are we when we talk about Martin Luther and the Reformation in the 16th century? Where, where did that take place? Germany. Germany, good. Good. Then we start to discuss Reformation that was happening in other places. Uh, we get to Zurich in Switzerland, and we think of the Reformation that's happening there. And what's the name of the gentleman who really spearheaded that in Switzerland? The kind of the Swiss Martin Luther, if you will. Who was that? Zwingli. Good. Good. Ulrich Zwingli. And so we talked a lot about him as well. And then we kind of stemmed off into a discussion a little bit that we started last week about the Anabaptists. Remember that they were the followers, the students or the disciples of Zwingli in Switzerland. And then the reforms that were happening in the city of Zurich, they were really uh, perturbed by the slow snail pace speed that Zwingli was having. And, and they were having issues because Zwingli was teaching them, hey, it's all about the scriptures. Uh, the, the Roman Catholic system is corrupt and is wrong and unbiblical. We want to make reforms. The city council said, yes, let's make reforms. Uh, so that was happening in, in uh, Germany, and it's happening in Switzerland, and it's starting to, to you know, gain some headway there. And then the Anabaptists, though, wanted to stand firm on the Scripture, a little stronger than Zwingli did. They wanted to uh, talk about things like infant baptism and, uh, versus believer's baptism and uh, you know things that we discussed about the priest celibacy and, and should they get married or are they to be celibate and uh, you know but really the bigger overarching things were uh, God being uh, God's word being the ultimate authority and not these uh, other outside councils and things that the Roman Catholics viewed as you know binding as as scripture also that Jesus Christ is the head of the church not the Pope as the head of the church and so all the all the issues that were there but we know that in that Zwingli wasn't ready to pick up all that and go strongly against it so in fact he ends up uh, debating and going in one of those disputations against his students and the council sides with Zwingli and remember the Anabaptists are now viewed to be uh, kind of rebels in that sense. And then there's this broad brush that's going to happen that starts to, to happen against the Protestants now to where there's, uh, again, persecution coming in because the Anabaptists, remember their big deal is Anabaptists meaning re-baptizing because they're re-baptizing people because they're believers now and they baptize them biblically is what we, we believe. And, but they were already baptized as, as infants, as babies, and so the city council doesn't want to do that. And so, remember, they put out an execution and a uh, death sentence of execution by drowning and essentially baptizing you permanently if you're going to be rebaptizing people. And so we saw a couple of those men that were uh, killed and martyred that way. Uh, but then also the problem was that they really had a problem finding somewhere to settle because... They weren't welcome now in Zurich because the uh, Zwingli's reformers, what we would call there, those reformers, they were against them and they were killing them by drowning. But then if they left there and they went into other city states, they were Roman Catholic. And so the Roman Catholics were persecuting them as well. And remember, they would burn them at the stake is how they would take care of that. Uh, so the Anabaptists are really kind of in a tough situation. And uh, but but. You know, as we saw some of that unfolding, we we start to see that now, as of last week, we have the Lutherans, right? Kind of the Luther Reform Protestants starting. Then we have the Zwingli Reform Protestants, and now we have the Anabaptists who are breaking off of that. So we kind of have three <coughs> denominations, if you will, quote unquote denominations. And out of that, we know you know there's going to stem many more denominations, and we'll talk about that moving forward some. Uh, but that's where we left off last week. This week we're going to pick up with a 
another uh, of the heavy lifters in the, in the 16th century, and that's John Calvin. So 1509 to 1564 is the lifespan of Calvin. And I know some of you are excited about Calvin as well as we were with Luther and, and uh, on and on and on. So definitely a, uh, you know, a big, uh, well-known believer and a, a very articulate, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But he's born in France. <clears throat> I put up here second generation reformer because really he's about 25 years younger than Luther and Zwingli. If you recall, actually, Luther and Zwingli were born in the same year. Okay, so they were on the same at the, born at the same time in the same generation. And so Calvin is about 25 years younger than these two. So he's not one of the one who is spearheading at, at the same time as Luther and Zwingli. He's kind of the one who's going to be, you know, taking the baton from uh, these guys and carrying it forward. Just like we know that Zwingli uh, met with Luther and, and was with him, but agreed in some and not in, in others. And that remember, Luther wasn't the one that started it with the 95 Thesis. Remember, he was getting the baton passed to him from others, like uh, John, John Huss, excuse me, uh, who got it passed to him from John Wycliffe, and who got it from Peter Waldo. And so remember, we've talked about this on and on and on, about how, excuse me, the Lord is the one preserving the gospel. He is the one who is opening the floodgates at this time in the 16th century, with the printing press coming along with all the uh, things that he used with Luther and, and Tyndale and Erasmus and others who are now... Uh, you know, translating scriptures into uh, the, the languages that the people can read and can understand and get their hands on Bibles now, okay? So Calvin's going to be one of the ones that uh, carries the torch from that time moving forward. Okay, so some history about Calvin. <clears throat> Let's get to know him a little bit. Perhaps some of us do know him a little. Um, we think, obviously, when you think of Calvin, you think of systematic theology, you think of things like Calvinism, you know, and Tulip and, and five and seven point Calvinists and all that, but uh, we will get there at some point, <clears throat> but let's talk about that. His mother died when he was very young. <clears throat> and Calvin's father encouraged his sons to become priests. He himself was uh, employed by the church. And this sounds very familiar, because remember I told you at this time, remember with Martin Luther, same thing. With Zwingli, same thing. Their parents wanted them to be priests or lawyers. Remember that? Priests or lawyers depending on where they were, because those were the two occupations that really made the most money, okay? Being a Catholic priest, you did well, and being a, a lawyer did well. So, again, I say this and bring it up again, as we mentioned with Luther and others, that these men were very educated, okay? They, they are scholars and, um, you know, intellectuals, because they had opportunities to go to higher learning and to colleges and, and, and further their education. Okay, so Calvin is uh, the same in a similar situation. He was educated in Paris. <coughs> he studied Latin and philosophy. So see, he's a smarty pants, right? Uh, which a lot of these guys were. Um, and on down the line, you're going to see that. I mean, a lot of these guys are heavy theologians, heavy um, scholars and studies, you know, even, even moving forward a couple of centuries, getting into like Spurgeon, you know, and on and on and on with these guys. <coughs> so... His father actually changes his mind later, encourages his son to become a lawyer because he believes the lawyers will make a greater living. Uh, and that's a big impact. So as we see these things, just remember, we're, we kind of live in a day and age where that's not as big of a deal. But back then, when you were uh, reared up by your parents, your father would be selecting, you know, and, and have a big say in what you were going to be doing. Um, so he was like, okay, you're gonna, you know, you should be a priest. Well, he's he's gonna go to school and, and try to uh, become a monk or get into a monastery, do whatever it is to become a priest. When they say, hey, uh, you should be a lawyer, it's it's more than a hint. It's go to school. You're gonna be a lawyer. Um, that's kind of what it was. So <clears throat> he went with that. He then studied law and learned Greek. So now he knows Latin, knows Greek, very helpful, right? Obviously, in the time and day and age that he lived. And uh, he earns his master's at the age of 19, which for us, again, that seems like, man, that's young. Uh, he really graduated from the college and thing that we talked about earlier. I believe it was at the age of 14. Uh, but, again, it was different in that time. And the people who had the means and had the, the ways to get into higher learning would do that. They would be school, young age, and they would continue right into school uh, and do their kind of college, what we would consider college education, higher learning uh, at 
13, 14, 15, uh, and then move on from there after that. And they would have their masters and, you know, they would be very educated by the time they were, you know, 18, 19 years old. Okay. So very smart, uh, very good opportunities that he had to, to go to these schools and things. Okay. So 1533, his friend Nicholas Kopp, this gentleman had to flee because he was speaking out against the Roman Catholic system. He was saying, hey, uh, this city needs to be reformed. We need to take a look at the church. Sound familiar, right? We've been through Luther. We've been through Zwingli. This, the Lord's continuing to open men's eyes and women's eyes to the truth of the scriptures because why? Now the scriptures are more available. And so as they're reading the scriptures, they're like, hey, something's wrong with this Catholic church thing that we're in. Okay, and so they're, they're taking them to take this to the church, they take it to the councils, and so he is one who is uh, outspoken about this, uh, and I put a little footnote in there that God is going to use all this in Calvin's conversion, because at this point he's not saved yet, okay, and again with Calvin we're, gonna, we're not going to see that dramatic story like we did with Luther and the, the lightning storm and the, you know, uh, save me and I'll become a monk and all that, that you know, his is very particular, uh, but we do know that Calvin's conversion comes out of all this, uh, and then Calvin also goes into hiding and eventually has to leave France because of the persecution. Okay, because remember, guys, persecution at this time was real. Mm -hmm. If you were in a city-state, remember the synergistic relationship, that symbiotic relationship of the church and the state. And that was a big difference in some of them, like uh, Luther and Zwingli and, and those guys, Calvin even. They wanted the church and the state to stay together. Uh, where the Anabaptists, remember, thought the church and the state should be separated. Uh, that way you're free to uh, have your freedom of religion and, and do as you please and preach as you pre please and worship as you please and not be persecuted for your different beliefs. Uh, you know, essentially they're like, hey, we're on the same page with all this stuff, only you believe in infant baptism and we don't. And so we're getting killed because we don't believe the same thing as you. You know, they're saying, hey, let, let us have some freedoms here. And, uh, and so that was a problem back then. And so when we see this persecution, we've talked about this enough that I, I believe uh, I don't have to too much anymore because I think you guys understand that if you were in uh, a place that was Roman Catholic, you were either Roman Catholic or you were getting persecuted, right? Or you better leave uh, because it was not good for your health. And so in that sense now, though, the Protestants are doing the same thing right now against the Anabaptists. We've seen that. That now the Protestants have gone out of the Catholic system, but now with the Anabaptists and the other people raising problems, they're now persecuting their own Protestant church and brothers and sisters. Uh, so the persecution was real uh, around there. So open it up your mouth in, in saying, you know, the Catholic system is corrupt and we should change these things was putting yourself out on the limb, okay? It, it could have been very dangerous and very, again, very hazardous to your health. Uh, 1535, this is significant, uh, to me very significant. Uh, 1535, he wrote the first edition because there were many revisions that he went going forward. But in 1535, he writes the first edition of what's called the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And if you've never heard of that, uh, definitely write it down in your notes. Look it up online. Uh, you can find, I actually have them on a podcast version uh, to actually, the guy who reads them is very monotonic and it's monotonic and very hard to follow. Uh, but you can go on and read them. You can go to other places and perhaps hear them audibly. That this is probably the most. I mean, the Institutes of the Christian Religion are probably regarded by every scholar and uh, church historian to be like the most significant Christian piece of work ever in the history of Christendom. Okay, uh, obviously we're not counting the Bible, <laughs> so uh, the Bible is in a in a class of its own. But uh, of a of a piece of work written by a human being, uh, this is you know probably number one in, in in all most all camps. Okay, higher than bondage of the will or any of the others we've talked about by Luther's writings and all these men that wrote you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. Uh, this one's huge, and so if you go and you look at it and you read it. Uh, some of it, at least, you can, you can see. It's very long. It's a lot. Um, but it was written, here's the thing, it was written as a response. Remember how I told you that there's no face chat, snap time, you know, blah, 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 all that stuff. How it happened is they would write letters and pamphlets and books back and forth 
remember about their discussions. And so Erasmus and Luther would write back and forth against each other's stance on things. Uh, you know, Zwingli and, and uh, Luther on some things, and others would do that. And so it would be a back and forth and back and forth. Well, the problem is, remember that broad brush again that I was talking about at the beginning, and we talked about it last week, that now Protestants are getting a bad rep because they're being viewed and misconstrued to be thought of as rebels. Remember that, that they're all about anarchy. Uh, they want to cause disruption in the government and overthrow the government. They're zealots, essentially, and they want to overthrow the government and take control of the city and the, and the state and, and be in charge, which was not correct, okay? Uh, they, they talked about Romans 13. We talked about that before, <clears throat> submitting to your authorities and all those things. But this is what was happening and how the, the uh, church state and even the Protestant states were painting this against the Anabaptists because they didn't like them. So the problem is the Anabaptists are grouped in the Protestants. So the Catholics and everyone else are saying, well, these Protestants, I mean, they're just, they're just crazy. And they're rebels, and they want to overthrow the government, and that's all they want to do. This religious thing they're doing is just a part of the plan that they, you know, they want to be in charge. And so what this Institutes of the Christian Religion is, this writing from Calvin, it's a written response to correct the view of what is being misconstrued. Okay, so I don't know if I've articulated that well. You understand what I'm saying? They're painting that, that, that the church is evil and bad and wicked and going in the wrong direction and trying to overthrow everything. And Calvin writes these things as a response to that. So when you look at these things, uh, and you'll hear, I mean, if you just go listen to sermons by, I don't know, any reformers, you know, today, uh, MacArthur, or Sproul, or Lawson, or on and on and on with so many of them, uh, you'll hear them often, R.C. often would talk about Calvin's Institutes. When you hear that, that doesn't mean like Calvin's Institutes like schools or something. He's talking about this. His Institutes are all these things that he wrote out that essentially would look like a doctrinal statement, right? It's, this is, this is what we believe on this. 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 Uh, and just kept adding to, adding to, adding to over the years and revising and revising and revising. Uh, so it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's huge. And so that's how it all started, was Calvin, this was his way of trying to stand for the faith and give the truth of what Christians believe. This is what our, the Orthodox Christian Church really believes. Not what you've been hearing, what you've been saying. This is what it is. And so this was kind of, again, his defense for that. Okay? Um, I know that's been a lot of information so far. Thoughts, <coughs> thoughts questions? Give you guys a couple. So minutes. he did it at 26 years old. Right? Well, who cares about anything when you're 26? Yeah. Other well, who gets a master's by the time of 19? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, uh, am I going to live with mom and dad forever? Or what's going on? You know? Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Knew how to make ramen noodles and pizza. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, let's continue then on, <clears throat> on this journey with Calvin. Well, if you know anything about Calvin, most of us think of Geneva. You associate Calvin <clears throat> with Geneva. And we talked, actually, I think it was Dave last week brought up a question about uh, translations and things. And I know we got into a little discussion of that, just kind of off the cuff rabbit trail. It was a good one. Uh, but when you think about that, <clears throat> I even brought him up last week talking about the Geneva Bible, which I believe the first edition came out like 1560-ish. And so you can see 1536, so in about you know, 20, 25 years, <clears throat> this Geneva Bible is going to come out, and he spends a lot of his ministry time here, but we're going to see he, he moves around to Strasbourg and other places. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, but that's generally what you think of when you think of Calvin, and he was actually in Geneva with a lot of big other names that we'll probably discuss uh, in future sessions, like uh, John Knox. I'm sure we definitely will talk about uh, John Fox. There was a lot of Johns. Uh, John Fox, which is where we get Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, which we discussed a few times. John Fox was there at Geneva at the, at, after this. And so uh, Miles Coverdale, who also uh, wrote, I believe he was the one who had the first total Old Testament, New Testament in the English language. That's called the Coverdale Bible. So Miles Coverdale, John Fox, John Knox, and they were all under the protection or the oversight of John Calvin in Geneva. And that's when these guys come up and, and write this Geneva Bible, which is still regarded as, you know, one of the best translations, uh, you know, even today. So 
here we go. Let's get to Geneva. 1536. He's actually heading to Strasbourg. Okay, so uh, Strasbourg is kind of a city that's on, I should have put a map slide in there when I was looking at it, but it's kind of on the, on the fringe or on the, the borderline um, of France and Germany. Okay, and then Switzerland is kind of down in the middle there. And so Geneva is in Switzerland, which we'll get to here shortly. So he was headed to Strasbourg, but on the way there, uh, and just how the Lord works, and that's what we're going to see in all this, uh, God gives him a little detour. And on the way, he, he comes through Geneva because he's trying to stay away from the French troops and the persecution that is on his tail. Okay, and so while he's here in Geneva, he meets a man named William Farrell. And this guy was a preacher in Geneva, and he was a reformer, okay? He's preaching against the sacraments and against the indulgences and against the Catholic system. Uh, so, again, this Pharrell is definitely another known uh, reformer. And he's here in Geneva, and he's trying to now, he meets Calvin, and he wants to recruit Calvin and keep Calvin here in Strasbourg with him, okay? Which makes sense, obviously, uh, strength in numbers, and a lot of these guys wanted to be together in these reforms and all this <clears throat> So uh, Pharrell does convince Calvin to stay at Geneva and to help him reform the city. So when we talk about reforming the city, what are, we dis what are we talking about? We're talking about trying to make a city go from Roman Catholic, right, to Protestant, and to the views of what we see as the reforms. I should say what they're saying is they see these reforms necessary because they see Scripture, and they see the things that they see in Scripture don't line up with the religious church system they have in their city. Okay, so uh, they would take that to the city councils and things, just like we saw Zwingli do, and Zwingli won. And therefore, the city council says, okay, uh, preacher, you go and preach the Bible, and you tell us what to do and what we change, and we'll reform the city. And that's kind of what it would look like. And that's why we see some of the cities were a little more tolerant of a lot of reforms, and some of them weren't so tolerant of other reforms. And so certain men like Zwingli kind of conformed to that. You know, were confined by that, and they were okay with that. But then other people, like the Anabaptists, weren't okay with that. They're like, you know what? No, if the Baptist isn't taught in there, uh, no, uh, this isn't right. No, that isn't right. We're going to stand for that, no matter what happens. And so some of them were able to uh, kind of bend their conscience, you know, and some of them were not able to do that. Okay, so, uh, so Calvin does stay, and he and Pharrell get to work, and uh, Geneva does start reforming and transforming um and so again we always talk about this guys but here's the key the thing that reforms the thing that converts the thing that revives its scriptures and so it should be uh no surprise really to us that in this 16th century period of time when we see luther put up in Wartburg and he starts writing the scriptures into the language of the people. When we see Erasmus translate into Greek and give the people a New Testament in their language, when we see Zwingli and on and on and on with these scriptures now being put out there and the, again with the printing press and the publishing and they're getting it out, they're getting it out, they're getting it out. People are reading their Bibles, people are preaching the Bible and teaching the Bible and so it should be no shock that this is like the time of revival and re reformation, okay? Uh, that, that when we do that, that's what happens. I mean, uh, you know, we've got Pastor Jonathan and myself here, and if Brian was here, he would say the same thing. I mean, we've seen uh, just in a short period of time that, 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 that we've been together here, uh, Reformation and the things that are happening in this church. Because why? Because God's Word does that. And so when you preach the Bible, you teach the Bible, you stand firm on the Bible, it's going to do a work. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just period. So uh, it, it's not surprising, but it's still magnificent. It's still awesome. <laughs> it's still awesome, and God is awesome. Okay, so uh, now with that being said, some of them go a little bit overboard. Calvin definitely could have done that. Luther definitely did that. Uh, and in those two, I want to I want to point this out also. These are like two polar opposite um, people in personality wise. Calvin, uh, I know I've uh, excuse me. I'll start with Luther. I've told you is a hot head, short tempered, can fly off the cuff, heat of the moment uh, kind of guy. Calvin is like total, reserved, calm, cool, collective, slow to speak, figured out kind of guy. So um, so in that, though, uh, very strict, 
okay? And so when, and you can see that in, in today and in different preachers and different things that, you know, we can become very strict uh, on certain points and people can be kind of, you know, they'll get labeled legalistic sometimes if you go a little overboard uh, on, on some of these things. <clears throat> and so you might see that here with Calvin, <clears throat> but he and Pharrell put in a strict code uh, in Geneva to help with these reformations. <laughs> City Council uh, Remember, So when we say City Council, that, that's an important thing to note. Remember, all these different European nations that we look at, kind of the European map that we're talking about. Remember, we went from emperors in the, in the East and the Western Empire. We've seen kings in France and England and all these magistrates and all these different things. The City Council would have been, you know, like the, the heading government of that city, you know, that particular city at that particular time. That it wasn't, remember, under the pope anymore under the emperor in, anymore because they were all segregating and they were all their own states you know um, so to speak and so these city councils had the authority uh, and the power in, in, to, at the time to do these things but men like Calvin, Zwingli uh, a lot of them get kind of a bad rep because it's like oh well Calvin did that blah 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 it's not Calvin who did that it's not Zwingli who did that it's a city council who does what they want to do but Zwingli's reforms, yeah, were adopted by the city council. But even if Zwingli didn't want to uh, uh, drown those Anabaptists, the city council did. So it doesn't matter what Zwingli wants to do. It's going to happen because the city council is the authority. Okay, so anytime we say city council, I want you to understand that. That's a big authority. It's over, uh, it's over Calvin's head. It's over, uh, you know, the governing body of these areas. Okay, so uh, it's not like a you know, city council that we think of, oh, we're just going to have a, you know, a, a chamber of commerce meeting or something. This is people who actually have the power and authority to make and regulate everything. In the 1600s, that's where people actually overthrowing all the rules, like in, in uh, the UK in the 1650, they over, tried to overthrow um, the rules by taking like a parliament, make a parliament of power, which is the same as this yes. city council thing. And there you the go. whole world was getting rid of the old God and trying to put the new God in. Yes. That was what was yeah, exactly. And that's a great picture. Yeah, that's a great picture. Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Tom Revolution and Lord Mervyn going. Yep. Generally happens. Yeah. So here is uh, some of the details of their of their rules, okay? No gambling, no dancing, no singing of immoral songs, and they put a curfew, a city curfew, into where everyone had to be in their house and out of the streets and out of the city by a certain time. Um, so, you know, some of those things we could be like, eh, and some of them like, oh. So that that was what it was, and you, you can understand that any time people are involved, uh, not everyone was a big fan of the moral code and of the rules, and not everyone wanted to live by those rules, especially as they uh, just came in and they've been living there, say, their whole life, and all of a sudden now you're going to put me under these rules. Uh, who are you guys to do this? And so there was definitely opposition, and we're going to see uh, that there's a growing opposition <clears throat> that's going to continue uh, to, to really form here. Okay, so these reforms are met with opposition. <clears throat> the reformers' opponents now, here's the, here's the catch and what's going to you know, heat it up and make a big difference, is they gain control of the city council. So they infiltrate the city council, and now the opposition has gained kind of, you know, you just think about as a, I, right now in my brain I can hear Albert Moeller's voice uh, just listening to like podcasts that I listen to every morning that he has it's called The Briefing, and essentially it's news. It's world news, but from a Christian uh, worldview point of view through Albert Moeller's teaching or, you know, thoughts and comments on it. And the one I listened to this morning, I mean, look at the news around us every day all the time. Democrats, Republicans, shutdowns, you know, Trump wants this, this person wants this, and the deals and all the stuff that we're talking about. Uh, same thing, right? Same exact thing. So you all of a sudden now don't have on the city council, some of the seats have changed over, and now the city council isn't a majority of fans of Calvin's reforms. Now the city council is made of a majority of the other side that don't like his reforms, okay? So the changeovers happened, and we got new, you know, lefts or rights voted in, and now it's swinging the other way, okay? So it's pretty typical, right? Uh, so tensions how, how mount. How long do you think that lasted? I mean, was that a year? Was that no? Years? It's been going. It's going to go on for quite a while. It's going to go on. We'll, we'll see Before it unpack. Before they were overthrown. Yeah. Before they had to leave. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and not too long because I'm going to show you here in a little bit. He's there in, uh, in this stay at Strasbourg, he's there for a little over like two years. Okay, so, so he's camp. about to he's about to get run out. Okay. So so two years ish now because okay. he's going to be there for about two and a half years. So yeah, good good question, Dave. So yeah, it's not a it doesn't take too long of a time to happen. <laughs> People don't like uh, their liberties to be taken away too much yeah. without, you know, being outspoken about it. So, great question. So, yeah, the tension mounts between now the reformers and, and the, the those who are in opposition of that, and you know, this causes a revolt. This causes persecution. It causes issues, and so now uh, Pharrell and Calvin are essentially forced to leave and uh, and to leave Geneva. Okay, so. Uh, he continues on to Strasbourg, which is the one I brought up a moment ago, and so that's what we're going to discuss and talk about. I guess I could have added a little bullet point on there for my, for the time frame, uh, but yeah. Strasbourg is in France. Yes, right. Just on, the on that, yep, just in inside of the of the border there, off off of Germany. And you can actually see because here's here's the slide. So Strasbourg is 1538. Let's do our quick math. And I noticed Dave is the math guy. He's been good on that the last couple of weeks. 1538 in Strasbourg, uh, it's 1536. See, he was in Geneva. And uh, by my recollection, uh, could be wrong, but I remember it was about two and a half years. It was into 38 some. Uh, so it was about two and a half years that he was at Geneva before they got run out of there. <clears throat> so not a pleasant thing, you know, not a pleasant time and in interaction and things in Calvin's life that he had there as it went sour. Uh, but now he gets to Strasbourg, and remember, that's initially where he wanted to go. Uh, the pit stop in Geneva wasn't on his calendar. But with life, you know, as, as seasoned believers that, that we have in here, you guys understand that the final destination sometimes on your map isn't the same one that the Lord may have. Mm -hmm. and, and even if it is, there are pit stops along the way that you did not intend on, uh, but that God definitely had intentions otherwise. And so... Uh, you know, he's he's orchestrating it, and he's the potter, and uh, he's the puppet master. And so in this, God had reason for what he was doing. And so he is now, though, getting to uh, where he intentionally set off to go, which is in Strasbourg. So 1538 to 1541, and I put those up there to keep that timeline on. You guys know I'm a big timeline guy. So look, he's only going to be in Strasbourg for two and a half, three years. Okay, so not very long that he's going to be there either. Uh, because you know something's going to change because I told you the majority of his ministry and his life is spent in Geneva. So you see, obviously, he's going to have to end up back in Geneva. <laughs> okay, so we'll get to that in, in a minute because he could be associated with Geneva, the Geneva Bible, in 30, 40 years and have his ministry be happening there, and he's only been there for two and a half years, and now he got kicked out. So now he's in Strasbourg uh, where he wanted to go. Uh, but again, we're going to see that the Lord's going to bring him back uh, to Geneva. So let's take a look at how that matriculates. <clears throat> so... This is the time, though, that Calvin himself in his writings refers to as his golden years. This was a much more tolerable, much more peaceful time uh, in Calvin's life where he experienced much more joy as a pastor, uh, you know, as a, as a leader of the church because he didn't have all the issues like he had back at Geneva and all the problems uh, and the headaches of the people and then the people, the opposition and all those things. And part of the reason was he was under uh, the tutelage and leadership of a man named Martin Bucer. Okay, Martin Bucer is a friend and a colleague of Martin Luther. Okay, and so Bucer is another one of the uh, kind of big names in, in the Reformation. And so he is there. And when Calvin gets there now, he has a strong, uh, you know, a strong friend and companion there in Bootser, okay? Now, this city, as Dave just brought up, is in France, but again, with all those European groups and how it works, that's just, uh, it doesn't really mean much. The, pri the city's residents were primarily actually German. Um, however, there were some French who fled there due to persecution of the church. So now, follow me in this. When we see the French have been persecuted and fled there, meaning that they were not conforming to like the Roman Catholic Church and the system where whatever city they were in, in France, were Catholic cities, understand? So these French that we're talking about are French people who 
were in with the Reformation and with the Protestants. So they're being persecuted now by the Roman Catholics in the city and they, that they live in. So they got to leave and they got to find somewhere they can go. And a lot of them end up in Strasbourg with Bootser and um, Calvin. Okay, And so he gets to be here with those people who are all like-minded with him in breaking out of the Catholic system. And he gets to, uh, along with Bootser, pastor and mentor these this group and and so this is a much uh better time in 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 the sense of ministry uh for him and his life makes sense right any uh, any questions pausing point there uh let you give a couple minutes to catch up on your note taken there thoughts uh either which way you can see the big deal of the day is obviously the you know the persecuting factor of going place to place and are you going to be persecuted by the catholics or are you going to be persecuted by the protestants uh you know and what does that look like and obviously now the in that the persecution would have been much lighter uh, from the protestants right the majority still of the area is roman catholic and they were definitely much more stern than the protestants because re really remember the protestants only have a little in their mind or a little small remnant of people who are going against the grain uh, which are the anabaptists so if you didn't loudly say that you were with the anabaptists on this then you could be fine right you could you could be safe uh in the protestant world you could because you could still say oh Roman, I'm not with the Catholic thing. They're they're crazy. Yeah, and I'm with the Protestant thing, and you'd be safe as long as you didn't bring up the, well, infant baptism is wrong, and you guys need to do this. You know what I'm saying? It's, so you could live peacefully in the Protestant lands, much more than you could the Catholic land. So, uh, you know, you'd have to just zip it and go along with the Catholic thing, and and you know, totally go against your convictions um, to to do that. But at least in most of the other areas like this, uh, so perhaps in this uh, French. Um, you know, congregation of reformers and of Protestants, there could have been different views on the baptism and on, you know, certain things, but they were still, they were still united, okay, because they were still united in the things that they weren't united with the Catholic Church on, which remember primarily are Christ is the head of the church, not the Pope. Uh, scripture is the sole authority of the church, not ecumenical councils and uh, you know apostolic succession hand downs and secrets and all that stuff um, so you know those those were the big deals breaking away from from Catholicism okay so Calvin ministers to them there also another bright spot in Calvin's life here in Strasbourg uh, is that he gets married okay and we'll we'll talk about that actually a little bit more here in, in, in the future later tonight uh, so he gets married in 1540. Also in 1540, he publishes his first commentary, <clears throat> which is on the Book of Romans, which we know, remember back to Luther, remember what the instrumental thing was in, in Luther's conversion by his own testimony was when he was a monk and he was preaching and teaching through the Book of Romans and Psalms, but particularly remember Romans 1, 16 and 17, uh, were the ones that he just couldn't get through and struggled with, and he said the Holy Spirit convicted him and convinced him, uh, you know, in those verses, uh, which recall are Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, um, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Right? 17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And those things were so heavy on Luther that it's not my righteousness uh, the righteousness of God is revealed through uh, you know the gospel and it's God's power that saved me and there's nothing I can do and so uh, the Lord opened his eyes with that so you can see that Romans is a big instrumental of, you know part of a lot of these men's conversions and and we've been going through Romans here uh, Sunday school I don't even know how long it's been now Greg but a long time and so we're actually in, in chapter 12 right now and yeah, if you've ever done an in-depth study of the Book of Romans, you understand the depths and the richness of Romans and, and how powerful it is. You want to preach the gospel? Yeah, that's what we want to do. Well, it's through and through in Romans. And in Romans, Paul talks about condemnation, justification, the whole everything. The whole ball of wax is in the Book of Romans. That's what Romans is all about. Well, brother, um, one of his major interests, the guilt thing, couldn't get 
practical one that couldn't get past. That's right. Yeah. Yep, exactly. The self-infliction punishments and yeah. the confessions every five seconds to the priests, yeah, and all that. He just knew there was something wrong with that. And Romans 1 uh, was really, when he was starting to get to that, is what God used to kind of, you know, turn turn on the, the heart light, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. yep. Good. Okay, so, uh, yeah, he publishes this, and, I, and we have, man, with Calvin, so many commentaries, uh, you know, and I know Pastor Jonathan uh, will be with me in understanding that, even if, if a lot of you don't, you know, do a lot of studies in that as you're preaching and preparing sermons, and you're looking back on, you know, what I like to refer as to, uh, you know, the old smart guys, the older guys, the smarter guys, uh, going back and gleaning from them, uh, you can find commentaries on Calvin, on Spurgeon, and all these guys, because their writings that's what they would do. Remember, they're, they're intellectuals, and in that day and age back then, they would do a lot of writings. Luther and all these guys, so many writings that we have from them uh, that are just great pieces of great works. And in fact, I think Calvin, I'm pretty sure, has commentaries on every book of the Bible but Revelation. Uh, he did not want to do a commentary, I know, on the book of Re Revelation. And in fact, that spurs my memory to recall, I think he did not do Ezekiel either. He may have done part of Ezekiel, but I know he didn't do the latter part of the book of Ezekiel, like chapter 38 and things, which talk about future eschatological prophecies, and he, he for whatever reason, wanted to stay away from that. So he didn't do uh, part of Ezekiel and Revelation, but he has commentaries on every other book of the Bible. Okay? So, um, so yeah, a lot, lot of writings, and uh, God used these men greatly, and we still glean from them. You know, we're looking... What, five centuries, you know, almost six centuries later, uh, you know, I know Jonathan does, I know I do as well, you know, we're looking back on these commentaries and, and gleaning from these, and, and uh, it's, it's a great blessing uh, to us. Obviously, the greatest blessing is Paul's writings and God's writings, uh, but it is still, remember, a good thing for us to glean from, you know, church history and the men that we've been talking about, and we see the good and the bad with all of them, uh, just like us, you know, they were men too. And uh, so they made mistakes and were wrong in areas as well, as they were just human. But here we go, back to Geneva. So in 1541, we see a, a great turn of events here, okay? And really, I keep coming to this point because it's really against Calvin's will, almost. And there we go again with the freedom of will and the bondage of will. And uh, he didn't enjoy the first time he went to Geneva. And remember, he didn't plan on it. He was going to Strasbourg, and he just got sidetracked and got in Geneva somehow. And, uh, you know, Pharrell talked him into staying, and then he got that whole jumble, and they got kicked out. And so now <clears throat> he doesn't want to go back either, uh, but he's going to end up going back uh, because, again, God has other plans uh, in store for him. So what happens is the city council that was in Geneva the one that kicked him out, because remember the changes that happened in the council, they have some other changes, and they change their view, and they change their mind on Calvin and Pharrell, because here's what happens. The council is realizing that they don't have, like, strong leadership. The council can't keep the reforms and preach the reforms and stand against the opposition of Roman Catholic uh, clergy, okay? And so the Roman Catholic, and remember guys, think about this, in, in all the <clears throat> councils that we saw and the disputations that we saw with Zwingli, the first one in particular, there was a Roman Catholic representative always there. The debate, remember, was this guy against this guy. And the city council would side with which side he thought was, which side they thought was accurate. And um, so in that, Zwingli won against the Catholic guy in um, Zurich. And so Reformation started there, and on and on and on. So this council realizes that they can't stand up to the Roman Catholic system, and their city is essentially going to become Roman Catholic again unless they can do something about it. So they understand that they need uh, strong theologians and strong, uh, biblically strong men who can stand in the face of opposition and adversity, and they realize that, hey, we just got rid of a couple of those <laughs> just a couple of years ago. Three years ago, remember we had two guys like that, and we gave them the boot. And uh, if we don't want this Roman Catholic thing to take over again, let's go get them and bring them back in here. Uh, so they ask for Calvin to return to Geneva. And about what I say about asking is, this is how this would work at that time. Uh, they had to ask the city council of Strasbourg if Calvin could come back. Because Calvin's been there three years. He's planted under now the city council in Strasbourg, no longer under Geneva's authority. 
And that's how that would essentially work, that the pastors and the leaders uh, that were under the city council in which they lived in, remember, they're still under the authority of those council members. Okay, so essentially uh, their job was given to them and was overseen by these councils and they could be hired or fired or run out of town or whatever by the council. Okay, um, so the Geneva Council now goes to the Strasbourg Council and says, hey, uh, we sure would love to have John Calvin come back here if you guys would, would be okay with that. And so Strasbourg really doesn't want to do it. They get talked into doing it. And so they come to a compromise. And Strasbourg says, you know what? We'll let them come back for six months. We'll give them six months leave of absent with us. And we will let them come to you and help you get, you know, the, a foundation laid, help him find someone else, um, help you get established on your own so that Calvin can then return to us in Strasbourg, which what I've already explained to you in, in his mind, in Calvin's mind, sounded good because he didn't want to be in Geneva. He wanted to be in Strasbourg, okay? Um, but we're going to see that that ends up not <coughs> happening. Uh, Calvin ends up spending the rest of his life in Geneva, which is going to be, Dave, I already got your math for you, 23 years. Yep. Okay, so 23 years uh, for the rest of his life he's going to be in Geneva. So it, it's kind of like that three-hour tour, <laughs> uh, you know, that ends up being the rest of your life until the show gets can canceled. Uh, that's what, what the endeavor that Calvin was on. Uh, he thinks it's a six-month stint, and he's going back and and he ends up staying for the rest of his life. God's going to keep him there. Now let's get into some pretty amazing things. Uh, John, imagine. <laughs> Brian, imagine, as he's going to be watching later. Uh, he's preaching reform. He is sold out and all in on this. And the reason why we have so much commentary from Calvin and so many writings and things from Calvin is because that's what he did. Uh, preaching six or seven times a week for years, for decades. <laughs> Okay, over 2,000 sermons, uh, and we have a great portion of a lot of those things, and really that's where, that's where a lot of commentary comes from in these, uh, in, in these reformers and in the, the, the day and age of these preachers, is they would preach so much that they would then write their commentaries from their sermon notes and, and interject those and write their commentaries, and then you know that would eventually get into like commentary Bibles and things like that. But... Uh, Lots and lots and lots uh, just being consumed. I mean, that's <clears throat> that's remarkable. I mean, I think of guys, I know Stephen Lawson. I follow him real well, real close. And uh, and he's probably, <clears throat> you know, almost mid-60s, early 70s. And, and he still is at a pace where he's traveling all the time and does like, uh, you know, four-ish, you know, preaching and teachings a, a week. Um, and some, so... That, that's a great deal. That's a lot. Uh, I can tell you I do two every week, and when I'm preaching, I do three. And, and I mean, it, it's, I mean, you've got to be committed. You know what I mean? It's, it's a lot. It's, it's constant study. It's constant prayer. It's constant learning. Uh, and so some of us love it. I love it. I eat it up. And, and you know, God gifts differently. Uh, I couldn't preach six or seven times a week. John probably couldn't preach six or seven times a week. Some of us uh, can only do this or some can do that, and God equips everybody differently. And so uh, that's, that's a feat that's just remarkable. <laughs> it's a feat that's just remarkable uh, to me. So, uh, again, amazing, amazing things that God does <clears throat> through uh, humans that he chooses to do them through. So let's go back now a little bit, backtrack, and talk about family life because I skipped over that. But Strasbourg, uh, remember 1540, he gets married. Here is her name. Idolette is her name. <clears throat> they actually were only married for, I believe it's nine years. We'll have, we'll have Dave, the math guy, do a math in a minute. But their marriage didn't last uh, too long, we're going to see, because she was a widow and had two children from the, her prior marriage. Uh, Calvin meets her, as we mentioned, in Strasbourg, and they get married, and they do start a family. Uh, but, however, they were only able to have one son, and he was born premature, and only lived for a few days. Uh, so that was obviously a devastating thing for Calvin and for Idolette and anyone who's lost, uh, you know, a child uh, understands, you know, the, the, the grief that that can bring and, uh, you know, whether it's a miscarriage or, or whatever, but to have something like that uh, is, is just got to be heartbreaking and difficult. Okay, and then Idolette dies in... Uh, 1549. So there you go. Nine nine years or so they were married. 
And this obviously weighs on Calvin greatly again. And so we've seen that with uh, you know some of these other men we've talked about, the depression that some of them got into. And again, they're, they're human, and, and these things happen, and it's difficult, and it definitely changes you. And so we see different shifts and things in their ministries and all. But uh, that is his family. We've talked about that with Luther. We've talked about that with Zwingli um, and the marriages. And why we keep bringing them up is obviously man and woman in marriage. The, these, these ladies, whether it's uh, Katie Luther or whether it's Idolette here, um, Calvin, they are significant and, and very much a part of the ministry of their husbands that we tend to focus on more but obviously they were blessed with this and remember that that was a big deal at this time because of celibacy in the Roman Catholic system remember that you were to be a monk and you were to be celibate you were a priest you were celibate you were none uh, celibacy was the way of life and we saw that they broke out of that with the Reformation saying that's not biblical um, so they were getting married and having families, and so that was a big deal because they were kind of waving into the face of the Roman Catholic clergy and the Roman Catholic system, saying, uh, you know, we, we are married and we're having children, and yet we're pastors and we're lead, leaders of the church. And so the Catholic system looked at that and said, you guys are, I mean, they're doing exactly the opposite of what we say that you're supposed to do. Uh, so it was really kind of in, in the face of them doing that. But we know that biblically, uh, it's obviously not only tolerable, um, you know, but encouraged um, and, and just fine for a man, obviously, to take a wife and to have children. Um, and, and so that's all good and dandy. They, they leaned on Scripture for that. Yeah, there's one, one line of Scripture that Paul says, right? You know, better that you don't be married, but rather than be tempted, you know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 is, right. is where that is. And yeah, and he talks about that in, in the sense of, obviously, when he says burning, you know, he means burning with lust and uh, sexual immorality. And if you can't deal with it, then get married because that's your outlet for sexual immorality is have a wife or have a husband, and then you, you can take care of those urges and do those things. And, in fact, then he goes on to say, obviously, don't deprive one another from it. Uh, but the husband, you know, is not the... Uh, boss of his body, the wife is, and the wife isn't over her body, but the husband is, and, and, and all that stuff, but then he, he says for him, you know, he says, though it is beneficial to be single, uh, you know, is what Paul's view was, because he was single, and if you think about it, obviously, it can be beneficial, because you're not tied down. Uh, if I was single, there's a lot of things that I could do, perhaps more for the Lord, that I can't do, because I have a wife and children, and so in Paul's view of that, it's fine, but he says also, the other view is fine. Like, it's fine if you can't do that, or that's not your call. Uh, which, obviously, you go to Titus and, and Timothy, where Paul gives the what are called the pastoral epistles, and he gives the qualifications. Um, I say he, Paul, but we know the Holy Spirit gives the qualifications for pastors, for elders, and the first one, you know, one of the first ones on the list is a husband of one wife. So, obviously, you're allowed to be married and be a pastor and be, you know, a leader and the elder in the church. So, yeah, good, good point. Okay, well, let's discuss this, because now we have another group, the Libertines. We've talked about, you know, groups of reformers and followers. Remember Peter Waldo? Remember what were his followers called? Anybody remember? Waldensians. Yeah, the Waldensians. Uh, we've seen Zwingli. What were his followers called? The Anabaptists. Yeah, good, the Anabaptists, right? Uh, but here's this group of opposition. The ones who opposed... Calvin and Pharrell the first time and kicked them out. They obviously didn't go anywhere. It's only a couple years later. It's still there. Uh, so they're still in the opposition of Calvin. Uh, and they are called the Libertines. Okay, so they are against Calvin's return and coming back and against any moral codes and things that he's going to put back into place, which obviously he's going to do as he comes back and wants to restructure and reform again. <coughs> Excuse me. And I want to talk to you about uh, specifics on some of this. Uh, this this one man, Ami Perrin. This is actually the guy, oddly enough, this is the guy who invites Calvin to return to Geneva because they know they need a strong uh, a strong preacher to go against the Catholic Church. So this guy 
uh, Perrin is the one who invites Calvin back, and he ends up actually becoming the leader of the Libertines against Calvin hmm. uh, because he doesn't like Calvin's reforms, and he gets busted on one of them uh, because he was dancing. And so they had the, the dancing prohibition and, and the rules and the moral code that was in play, and so he got in trouble. And so he becomes uh, consumed with this and becomes against Calvin and becomes kind of the one of the leaders of these libertine uh, groups of the, of the movement that is against Calvin. So Calvin's back into the opposition and back into uh, the stuff away from the joy and the peace and the life he was living. The, the ministry he was loving in Strasbourg is now gone. He's back in Geneva, and here it all comes back in his face again. <laughs> okay, so persecution in a different way, right? He is going to be suffering at the hands of, of uh, Perrin and, and the Libertines. But the difference is now uh, the council is with him being there, right? So he's not being run out of the city because the council is on Calvin's side. So he does have a little leeway and a little protection in that sense, right, that the council is siding with him. For instance, like the council sided with Zwingli over the Anabaptist. So, you know, that, that at least had a little bit of protection there that the Libertines couldn't do too much and get too crazy on Calvin because the city council was with Calvin and not them. Okay, so it escalates as it always does and he eventually gets a threatening letter put on his pulpit at the church. A man, Jacques Grut, confesses to the crime actually under torture, so see it's not a new thing uh, that we see in this day and age where cops put you in for 40 hours and, and beat you up and make you confess to things. Uh, so I don't have the full knowledge and the full story on that if it was a false you know, confession or truthful. Uh, but this man confesses to putting the, sp uh, the spiteful and hateful letter and the threatening letter on Calvin's um, pulpit. And he, in fact, is sentenced to death by the council for doing so. So, see, the council is on Calvin's side. <laughs> uh, this libertine or this guy who did this is going to be taken care of because again you are against the religion of the city then you are against the city uh so by being plan you know again remember by being called and labeled a heretic you're being called and labeled a traitor and a, a hater of the city and anything that comes your way is deemed doable so this is how we deal with heresy this is how we deal with traitors you're in the same boat because again church and state are together. So here we go with another shift. <laughs> the Libertines grow. Uh, the opposition grows again to where now the Libertines take over the council again. So now, what obviously is going to happen? Calvin's in trouble again. Right? Calvin's in trouble because the Libertines are taking over. They are now going to be authoritative over him, and no longer will he have the protection of the council over him. However, we know there's got to be a different ending to the story than the first time because I've already, I've already kind of skipped ahead and, and ruined the ending for you and told you he's going to stay in Geneva. He's not going anywhere. Okay, so he's not going to get run out this time. Uh, he wishes that he would have. Okay, he, he wished he could have left. He asked to resign uh, and to leave. And since, hey, you guys don't like me, uh, I don't particularly care for you, and we are not like-minded and we're not on the same team, and I really, really enjoyed my time in Strasbourg and would love to return back to there. Uh, why don't you just do us both a favor and cut me out of here and let me go, and we'll just go our separate ways, and uh, no harm, no foul, we'll be done with this. Uh, but <laughs> they are spiteful, and they don't want to do it. And again, the council is the authority over him, and they, in fact, would have the, the power to, if he makes certain claims and says he wants to do stuff, they could execute him. See? So they have the final say of, yeah, we're not letting you go. We're the boss of you, and, and we're in control of the whole situation now. So uh, he asked to do that, and they declined it because they want to just hold him under their thumb and, and destroy him and make his life miserable. So it's almost like he'd be a deserter if he left. Right. Wow. Right. And they could even not even let him leave because, you know, they say, hey, well, you're against us in the forms that we're doing in the city, and we're the council, so you, in fact, are a heretic, and you, in fact, are a traitor, and we'll kill you. Like we just did to the other guy that threatened you, and he got killed? Bring it. <laughs> right? So. But what use was he to them 
they didn't agree with him. Why? You know, I, I get that they want to make his life miserable, but maybe. they're not. Essentially, good question, great question. That's that's literally it. It's spite and hatred. That's all it is. Oh, yeah. So that we're not going to allow you to go off somewhere and live a happy life and do what you want to do. We're going to make you stay right here where, where you're supposed to be because we don't want you to do anything except for what we want you to do. We want you to understand that we have the power over you to do whatever we want to. Uh, and so men lord that power greatly, and they still do today, and they always have and always will. It's, it's just, it's, yeah, everywhere, everywhere. That's just uh, how it is. So, yeah, good point. It, it didn't do them any, any good. And actually, remember, this has happened many times, especially in the switch over now put our Roman Catholic hat on. Let's get over to that side for a moment. We've seen this many times happen. In fact, Erasmus is the one that sticks out uh, mostly, that Luther had a big problem with Erasmus because Erasmus, remember, was a Catholic priest. He talked about reforms when he spoke. Martin Luther actually said that when Erasmus spoke, he sounded like a reformer, but yet he never left the corruption of the Catholic Church. He stayed a priest because it's good for you to stay a priest. Uh, it's wealthy, you have influence, and you have stuff, and the Catholic Church was okay. Remember, to your point, what benefit was Erasmus then? Because he was unhappy and swimming upstream. Well, the Catholic Church didn't really care because they could put him and control him and keep him where they wanted to put him and just put him wherever they want. They had bigger fish to fry and Martin Luther and others who were outspoken loudly uh, in reforming places. They wanted to fry those fish rather than the Erasmus guys who still stayed kind of in stream and, and under their authority. So, yeah, these guys just wanted to, to keep wraps on him and shut him up and, uh, and say, look, you wanted to reform and you wanted us to put us under your rules? Well, you're under our rules, and, and that's just how it's going to be. You know, kind of like the, hey, uh, you know, this is what I think of your letter. I'm going to burn it because you're going to burn me. You know, and the whole, well, we're burning people at the stake because that's what they're going to get a taste of. You're going to be burning in hell because you've gone against us. Uh, or, you know, well, you want to rebaptize? Well, we're going to baptize you permanently. It, it just is the evilness of people and, and, and how they, you know, how we are <laughs> without, Christ, without Christ, certainly. So I guess my question to you is, his, his job and his position was still to preach sermons. However, they were more dictated to him, you know, what sure. he was not they allowed would... to say this. Sure, and they but would... You could do all this, but you can't. Yeah, but you can't set these reforms to what we don't want you to do. You know, just like, and essentially, that's what it was in Zurich, with Zwingli. Zwingli was just okay with that. See the difference? Zwingli was okay with the, the council saying, well, we don't want to change the baptism thing. Let's keep infant baptism. It has to do with the city and who's in the city and members, and we're not changing all that. And Zwingli was like, okay, I'm fine with that. You know what I mean? Uh, but others weren't. You know, obviously the Anabaptists, Calvin, uh, Luther, no way. <laughs> yeah, you would have had war with Luther was in those situations. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Uh, good, good point there. Good point there. Well, we got about 12 minutes. Uh, I do have. Let's go forward. We'll talk about one more thing that we can got time to close with this tonight. Uh, because I bring up Michael Servetus. <clears throat> this is a name, Servetus. And I know this is the first time. Uh, you know, again, this is kind of a survey, kind of a topical uh, study, and, and topical. I mean, you know, top level. We're not digging deep into. A lot of these, you know, historical things, you know, we could have talked about hundreds of other church leaders in, in the patrician period and on and on and on and on. So uh, we're, we're getting a pretty good overview. I mean, uh, the stuff we're learning and getting through this is definitely, uh, by the time you guys are done with this, even whatever, even whatever we can retain and recall from memory is going to be a hundredfold more knowledge about church history than anyone sitting in a pew in any church, uh, you know, in, in America almost, I would say, okay? Because we are very ignorant as believers on these things, which is one of the reasons we're doing it. It's important. Okay, so Servetus is a name that pops up with Calvin, especially in Arminian circles. And we'll talk about that more as we'll talk about Arminius and others later, but you guys understand what, uh, some of you understand what I mean by Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism and Arminianism, okay? And re remember that, that it's, Calvin is, uh, you know, let me start with Arminius. Arminianism is <coughs> men are essentially 
okay and good and that maybe Adam, you know, sin did affect us, but it didn't affect us in the sense of our will being taken away, that we are free will beings and we are capable of accepting or rejecting the message of the gospel, that we are essentially good and can do that in our own free will. Uh, Calvin, on the other side, says men are totally depraved, totally evil, totally wicked, none are good, no, not one, no one seeks God, that means no one. Uh, so, without God intervening, you have no free will and choice and chance to make a choice because God is the one who must do that. And so there's the two sides of the coin, and it's going to continue on and on and on through history. And it was way before Calvin. Calvinism was w around way before Calvin, and we've talked about this already. We go back, we saw Augustine art articulating this against Pelagius. Before that, we saw Athanasius doing it against Arius. It's been on and on and on and on. And so when we say that, I want you to understand that's the two different views. Free will, and we can choose God. Uh, bondage of the will, and you can't choose God because you're incapable of doing it. God is the one who does the work. So when uh, the Arminius, the free will people, will like to kind of throw mud at Calvin, this is, if you talk to someone who's a little more knowledgeable than just your normal Arminian, uh, they will go to, to this person. And so let's talk about this. He was a heretic, a uh, well-known heretic by the Catholic Church, by the Protestant Church. Uh, so this guy was hated on all sides, okay, because of his false views of the Trinity, which we know, as I brought up uh, Athanasius a moment ago and Arius, that was all the way from uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325, from the first council. Remember, that was about the Trinity. And so Athanasius was the one that articulated Trinitarianism, and that was the Orthodox view of the Church, and the Council sided with him against the others and the other views of God being single and being, you know, plurality and all that stuff. So this guy has a heretical view of the Trinity. So he's opposed by both sides. He now writes letters and exchanges letters, and Calvin uh, entertains that and, and exchanges a few letters with him uh, until he understands what this guy is all about, and then he refuses to correspond with him anymore. Uh, as he does declare him and views him and recognizes him as a heretic. He is Servetus, is he? Ser Servetus is arrested in France and is actually sentenced to death uh, for being a heretic. So uh, he escapes and he gets away and he doesn't get killed. But he was sentenced to death for being a heretic already. While he's on his way to Italy, Lo and behold, he has a pit stop at Geneva. Sounds a little bit like Calvin, right? See, it sounds like Geneva is like on the way to too many places and people get stopped in there. Uh, but this is what happens, and obviously he stops there in Geneva because he knows Calvin's there. Okay, so on his way to Italy, he stops in Geneva uh, to come and to, you know, do whatever I guess was on his agenda to meet with Calvin or discuss things with Calvin or kill Calvin. Who, who knows? Uh, so he's arrested now in Geneva by the council. He is found guilty by the council, and he is burned at the stake as a heretic. In this... The, the, the council of Geneva, though. Yeah. 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 I thought they were Protestants. Exactly. Good catch. Yeah, they are, and uh, but that's what they chose to do with them. Because really... Uh, so you understand, if I understand right, Jason, you're, you're bringing up the point that he, because he was burned? Right. Yeah. Good. So, um, yeah, he wouldn't have been, the thing they were doing the drowning for, remember, was the Anabaptist thing. So he wasn't a, quote-unquote, rebaptizer. so they didn't kill him like that. Uh, they went with the burning of the stake because it was typical, you know, way of, of torture and killing somebody. And in fact, Calvin was the one that went to the council and asked for what at the time was viewed, and, and I would say probably so, uh, was viewed as a more humane way of executing somebody, which was beheading. So Calvin went and said, hey, uh, let's just do this. And the council said, no, uh, we're going to burn him alive. And so uh, that's what they did. So several of the, the funny thing, the irony about this is, several of the libertines were part of the trial against Servetus. And they had to, in fact, side with Calvin in the trial. And I don't mean on the execution part, but in the trial against him to try him as a heretic. They were on the same side as Calvin. Be, even though they hate him, and they hated doing that, uh, they were on the si same side as Calvin because they're on the same side on the, in that sense. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, we believe Trinitarian. Yep, Calvin believes Trinitarian. Yep, you don't. Uh, well, 
oh, how does that work? Well, Calvin's your buddy now again. <laughs> okay, so in that sense, it, it was just an irony of how it played out that they had to view themselves in the same boat as Calvin again uh, because of, again, the, again, the doctrine of that day. So you guys uh, well caught that and saw that before I even had to say it. Uh, but here's where this comes into play. <clears throat> um, for a long time, and still today, still today, I actually have a funny little cartoon I'm going to pop up and show you that I saw come through one of my threads uh, about this. So Servetus and its execution, for a long time, people throw this at Calvin mm -hmm. and say that, uh, see, Calvin was, you know, wrong, and he was mean, and he was spiteful, and he was violent and judgmental, and Servetus died because Calvin wanted to him dead. Uh, and so it's a very ignorant position, a very unlearned position. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just throw that around and they don't know any, they have no clue about what they're talking about. Uh, it wasn't true. He wasn't the authority, as we've already talked about. They were under the authority of the council. The city council was the one who made these decisions. And in fact, uh, I already told you that Calvin was the one that tried to change it into a more humanist way of executing him. Uh, to kind of save him that, and uh, and didn't want to burn him at the stake, in fact, but the rest of them did, okay? But it was the, the council who uh, convicted Servetus and executed Servetus. It was not Calvin, although Calvin, understand now, was in the boat of, he's a heretic. And so, you know, at that time, that was a typical normal view, like Zwingli. Zwingli wasn't the one... Uh, permanently baptizing and drowning people that were against him, but the council above him was doing it, and he he was okay with it. He had to be mm -hmm. fine with it. Sure, my hands are clean. Pontius Pilate, right? Washing his hands clean. You say you're washing your hands. You're a part of it, okay? Um, so that was just the view in the 16th century that, again, with the church-state marriage thing and, and being combined, that you're a heretic. Again, you're a traitor, and that's executable by death. Mm -hmm. And so the pastors and the people in the church were good with that. And they believed that that was fine. Okay, so that was just the, the day and age and how it was. And so that's really what he was guilty of, was... Heresy. He was trying to separate... I just did a little quick deal on him. And he was, on Servetus? Yeah, he, yeah. Was, he was trying to get back to pre nicene creed and yeah. separate the church and state and focused on being a Christ-centered right deal. Uh, so that's really what, what the deal was. It was political. Oh, yeah. Right? Hugely political, but... Wasn't that his theology was wrong? Well, you mean Servetus or Calvin? Servetus. No, Servetus, Cal, uh, Servetus theology was wrong. He was the, the overarching thing over all that that you're talking yeah. about. The political bullet against him was the Trinitarianism because he didn't believe in the Trinity. That's, oh, did not believe. Did not. Oh, okay. That's how he got labeled a heretic, gotcha. and that's how they got him, and that's how they nailed him. That's how he got, before that in France, he was called a heretic because of his false views of the Trinity, okay. and they were going to kill him. So the Catholics were going to kill him because he wasn't a Trinitarianism, ah, okay. and now the Protestants did kill him because, because of that. All that other stuff's in there, but the main thing was his heresy because of his false view of Christ. Okay. Uh, he believed one, one God. You know, one God, and they would switch hats or whatever. And, you know, just all the things, like you said, pre Nicene Council, there were some little sects and cults that believed that. Okay. And the Nicene Council, their main objective was to address that. And they did, and they said Trinitarianism is the Orthodox view that Athanasius in that council argued against Arius and some others. Okay. And they won out, and Arius and those others were called heretics and had to vamoose. Yeah, good. So there's no necessarily idea why he decided to go to Geneva, Servetus? To, like, right. To, he was already considered a heretic there, and Calvin considered him a heretic, so... Right. Why go but I don't know that he. I don't know that he knew that. I don't. I don't. I didn't get. I didn't see any of that or get that deep into it. I don't know that Servetus knew that Calvin thought he was a heretic. He just knew that Calvin stopped replying. Uh, Calvin stopped replying because of his views and he didn't want to have the dialogue with them anymore so perhaps he was going to seek calvin out to continue those conversations um you know so i don't i don't know the i can't speak intelligibly about the motives you know that he that he had um but yeah certainly he could have he could have and may not have known and probably did not know calvin's view of him until he got there
So we'll close with this, uh, as I said about the Calvin thing. And this is funny, and you can look up the scriptures later. But uh, So you got the Calvinists on the left, you got the Arminian on the right, and they bring up scriptures, you know, to go back and forth. Well, this says God elects and God chooses. Well, this has a door open for maybe man choose and free will. Um, and so he brings up John 6, which is a big one about, you know, God draws people, 1 Timothy 2, 4. So they keep bringing these things up. Now, step it up a notch, the Calvinist goes to Romans 9, uh, which we know Romans 9, 10, 11 are just huge. And I don't know how you get around that. Uh, it's kind of the silver bullet of God does the work. And so this guy spits out Servetus. And that's what the whole thing, well, Servetus, you know, and Calvin was wrong and he killed guys, you know. Um, and, and that's kind of, uh, and then see, sorry, I panicked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so anyways, it's just a, a funny, funny thing that, uh, that I saw in the class when I was taking it. I thought, oh, that's pretty, pretty humorous. But only really some of you that are um, maybe strong on the Calvinist side will, will find the humor that I find in that too. But either way, it's out there for you. Um, thoughts, comments? That's one of the first Questions? things I ever heard about Calvinism. Servetus? Servetus. Really? Yeah. That's funny. Because most what? people don't even get Calvinist into that. Servetus. I said, what? That's funny. How to look it up because you know who Servetus right. was. Right. Yeah, because most people, that's, that's what I'm saying, is most yeah. people, even the Arminians, I don't think most people are educated and would understand and bring that. Like, I've never, I've never had anyone bring up Servetus in, in a debate or question, conversation with me. Um, perhaps some of them were well educated enough to know better, but right. most of them, I believe, are just ignorant enough. They have no idea who Michael Stravitz is, <laughs> or what the thought of against Calvinism is. So, uh, yeah, that's funny, man. For a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So you could read one sentence, yeah, and yeah. it would make Calvin a total murderer. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, and there'll be plenty of websites yeah, yeah. on the internet yeah. that will say Calvus was a heretic and murderer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and so all his theological yeah, yeah. thoughts should be out the window because he's horrible. Yeah, you'll, I mean, you could go find countless websites that right. would say that. Sure. Yeah. And then countless websites also that say our many same thing about our I'm sure on the other yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. So, good. All right, good stuff.